Welcome to this Architecture Today webinar with SIG. What is the future for hotel design after Covid? There's plenty of opportunity for Q&A and if you'd like to submit a question, simply click on the button on your screen. We're delighted to have three expert panellists who will be taking part in a panel discussion later, chaired by Ruth Slavid. The format for today's webinar has each of our expert panellists setting out their own perspective. We'll hear from Mark Kelly, Partner, PLP Architecture, and also Ross Finney, Sales Director, SIG Design Technology. To get started, let's begin with Dexter Morin, Partner, Dexter Morin Associates. So first, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this uh, debate on the future of hotel design post-COVID. Um, I'd say that um, the concept of local, local, local is interesting one for me because people say the property adage has always been locality, locality, locality. But local, local, local is very important because hotels were reinventing themselves as active neighbourhood participants well before COVID. Uh, if I can show one of my own projects, on the image on the left is what I would refer to as a furniture warehouse, which is what hotel lobbies used to be like. And that same lobby transformed in the bigger pictures that you see there to create a place that attracts people, attracts not only guests, but it attracts neighbors and it attracts people who want to come and, you know, have a coffee, uh, sort of have a chat, have a meeting, work. Uh, and that, in a sense, is what's happened to hotels in, in the way that they have actively participated in being part of the neighborhood. Um, the opportunity that hotels offer ahead of other similar op facilities such as cafes and bars is that there's the added benefit of service, hospitality service and also facilities. This is in the same Camden Holiday and you can see there are actually printers here and various kit that people can just use. Uh, and part of the deal is, you know, you might buy a coffee or a drink or whatever the case may be. Um, the other thing that's very interesting is that hotels are kind of 24-hour operations. If you think that they also bake bread in the morning for the guests, why not offer that to uh, the neighbourhood? And this is the Indigo Hotel in Kensington, and this is their deli counter. And this is available in the morning to pick up your croissants or fresh bread, or in the evening to pick up some artisan <laughs> produce or bottle of wine or whatever the case may be. But it's quite an interesting concept that the hotel, because it's open so many hours, can actually form a relationship with neighborhood facilities, even dry cleaners, florists, and can take their wares after hours and trade them, as well as providing a useful facility that enhances the neighborhood and provides neighbors with facilities so that hotels are no longer just for guests. That's that local, local, local concept. And this has spread this hospitality concept into hotels, into apart hotels, and to that extent into PRS uh, to create great social places. And uh, after COVID, we all know how important social things are. We always we look forward to it, but place great places to work, eat and meet. I mean, the other thing is I'd say that it's totally not home from home. People used to say oh, hotels will give you a home from home experience. It's completely the opposite. Uh, the appealing interior design or vistas that are a sea change from being home working. So this, for example, is the new Western, which is going to open next year on the Thames. And I mean, people will gravitate here to work, meet, eat, drink uh, post COVID because of the view and the ability to to have a new experience. Equally, um, hotels offer the ability through their design to create meeting spaces with personality. Uh, and this is interesting. This is the Ventry and Mercy in the city, and it's quite close to Bloomberg's head office. And uh, a lot of big corporates like Bloomberg come and rent space here because they actually want a meeting room that doesn't feel sanitized, that it actually has the feeling of a space that's of interest. So that sort of design aspect is, is critical. Um, the other thing is obviously food and beverage and smart technology coming together. Um, no longer do you have to have a waiter come to your table or your workspace in, in this co-working environment that we're going to share. You can summon whatever you want just on your mobile phone. In the same way you can check into a hotel as you've been able to do check into planes. Um, 
the technology it has been there for some period of time and it's being adopted more and more for uh, that, if you like, touchless interface, which is part of our um, social distancing. Bedroom design is an, another e supreme example of that. I mean, this idea of a touch-free, sanitized and safe environment is, is really important. Um, and I'd say that hotels offer that in a kind of a guaranteed way by virtue of the brands that and, and, the, and the, the policies that they have far ahead of the competitive set of, say, Airbnb. Nobody knows how a place has been cleaned to the same extent. But here is an example of something that we designed uh, for COVID. Um, as you go down a corridor, you're looking for your hotel room, you find a number. Well, that number can also provide a light to the corridor and it also has a, an inbuilt hand sanitizing device. I mean, one of the problems of hand sanitation bottles is we've had a proliferation of plastics again, which we were trying to get rid of. So this is a means of, it, of, of moving away from this, but you, you can arrive at your hotel room. It'll have a, a plastered sticker across the threshold saying that, you know, this has been sealed and it's, it's only for the guests to break that seal and enter into a safe environment. And these uh, sanitation devices beside will enable you to wash your hands uh, before you enter. And once you're in, you have that ability to now say to uh, your um, hotel that you don't want the maid to come and clean. You're perfectly happy to, to uh, just have the room, make your own bed or not, as the case may be. So these are the options that are available and, and changes the way in which people might use those hotel rooms. Equally, Workspace within the hotel room becomes quite important. I mean, there's for a long time been very good technology in hotels, good Wi-Fi, all that sort of stuff. But uh, design may try to differentiate that, that workspace from not being just an adjunct opposite the bed to maybe being a slightly uh, separated space that gives you the feeling that you are in your own little private office room. So the idea of being able to work in your room in your safe environment is quite important. The other aspect is exercise. And obviously the television screen in a hotel is obviously able to connect to all manner of um, exercise regimes or websites or whatever you may like. But hotel spaces can also accommodate uh, portable gym or running machines or, or things like that, depending of course on size, some of the new 12 square meter rooms, it's gonna be a bit of a challenge, but um, the ability for a hotel to say to uh, guests, look, we can bring up to your room, you know, a, 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 some, some kit where you can exercise yourself. So these are changes in terms of space, in terms of how you allocate um, things. I mean, one of the other aspects that have been looked at is the concept of beds that fold into the walls so that you could have rooms literally rented as meeting and workspace during the day and rented again in the evening for, for people to sleep over. And maybe it's the same person doing both, but not necessarily, provided a good cleaning regime comes in. Uh, so that's another option. The other thing about uh, hotel design of the future is the use of materials. And uh, one of the interesting things is the uh, quality of viral surface retention of different materials. Funnily enough, copper and paper have viral surface retention of, of the best quality. Uh, three to four hours, any virus that would have been touched that surface will have disappeared. Whereas something even like stainless steel or glass or plastics will take three to four days. Uh, and that's a big change for uh, what you might do in terms of design. Um, the other aspect is critical is the concept of biophilic design. We all feel comfortable that plants help to clean the air, also provide a kind of a natural screening when we're looking at social distancing. So we're going to, I think, see a lot more uh, plants playing an active part in, in hotels. And certainly the New Western that I showed you pictures of before is, is predicated on the concept of biophilic design. Um, the other aspect is uh, so to talk about social distancing and, and the question of is it duct tape versus design. We've seen so many spaces, so many streets with tape all over it uh, that you can keep your distance. Well, we knew, you know, designers are moving that forward a little bit and creating natural uh, spaces using the materials we talked about. But this is an interesting example of a, of a new project which is repurposing a, an old police station in which there were stables for horses. 
and we've retained the, the, the stable forms, as you can see in this image, to actually provide quite private and socially distanced booths uh, for, in which to eat. So there's all sorts of creative things that architects can do to create that, and interior designers obviously, to create that sort of social distancing in a manner that doesn't look uh, like an afterthought. The other thing that is quite important, I think, in, in terms of moving forward post-COVID is the question of fresh air. I mean, many people have fought for many years to make sure that the windows in, in hotels can open so that you can have that option of fresh air. Um, it isn't always uh, ideal, particularly at this time of year, it's quite cold. Um, and for many years, hotels, as many other buildings, have operated from vast uh, uh, rooftop air conditioning plants that pump air around a building. And that in its own way is quite expensive, but it also helps to bring viruses from one room to another and to spread it. And this is a concept of, a, of repurposing a, 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 an old hotel by actually creating new bays, which are popped out of the facade to give it a little bit of design. And those bays incorporate individual air handling units in the base of what is a window seat. This is a brilliant idea because it saves that massive amount of plant that needs to be on the rooftop. It gives people ultimate control whether they want air conditioning or heating or just to open the window and have nothing at all. So I think there's going to be a, a, a real adoption of this kind of technology as we move forward away from big central plant. And then finally, um, Going back to the concept of local, 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 there's a, an idea that we won a competition for some years ago, and it was called the Edible Hotel. And this is the ultimate bit of sense, uh, sustainability on a local, local, local basis, which suggested that the hotel could have an aquaponics uh, regime, whereby you had a, a fish tank and the water from that fish tank was interfacing with the plants and the plants were, were actually produce. And, uh, so you, the hotel was able to produce a certain amount of its own vegetables and produce and equally the fish tank would provide the ability to provide uh, fresh fish uh, to the guests and the thought was that you might provide uh, maybe 50 or, 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 or 75 percent of hotel meals just from local provenance and from the hotel being as I said the edible hotel. And it's not that far-fetched because the Hilton Bankside, which we designed some years ago uh, uh, near Tate Modern, has beehives on the roof and they harvest their own honey, which they serve in the restaurant. So I think there's all sorts of new futures uh, in uh, uh, the post-COVID world that we look forward to. Thank you. Thank you, Dexter. Panel discussion and Q&A follows after our presentations. And next we have Mark Kelly, partner, PLP Architecture. Thank you very much for inviting me to talk on this uh, topic. It's a topic that I feel uh, quite strongly about, to be honest with you. Um, and as I sit here uh, in the office today, um, there is uh, a very large part of me that uh, wants us to get back to normal as quickly as possible. But um, I have a concern that we probably won't be able to do that, um, at least not in the um, short to medium term future. And I think there could be uh, long lasting changes associated with the effects of uh, coronavirus. Um, in tourism and uh, travel and for hotels, um, you know, those things are not going to disappear. Um, and the effects of uh, the coronavirus upon hotel design is going to act as, I think, a catalyst for change. Um, what I would hope, though, is that that change can be um, incorporated for the better and provide benefits to both the hotel industry, local communities and guests alike. I think what we need to do is to understand why there will be a difference. If you have a look at um, figures associated with reduction in worldwide air travel, this year there were forecast to be 4.72 billion air passengers. And the revenue for this year was supposed to be $581 billion. In, in, in effect, we've actually ended up with a, well, uh, with a loss of $314 billion. So that is a, a, a marked impact 
um, in respect of a uh, number of airline passengers. And when you actually have a look, um, we know from historic data that the effect of the financial crash in 2008 had a massive impact on business travel. So in 2006, there were 18 million business travelers. And in 2014, that number had reduced to 15 million. And there was a, a sort of concerted uh, reduction, and I'm sure there will be, based on the um, uh, impact of coronavirus on um, business finances. And whilst um, every day at the moment it appears that we're hearing great news um, in respect of uh, vaccines and um, the fact that vaccine programmes um, are a number of weeks away before they're being introduced, um, there are some great minds who uh, seem to be saying that it will take several years to see if vaccination really does work and is absolutely safe. And I think it will, it, it will you know, take a, a, a certain amount of time um, for those vaccines to actually sort of um, show their effect in communities. So what will that mean for hotels themselves? Well, PricewaterhouseCoopers earlier this year published um, some figures as to uh, where they see occupancy rates uh, within London and the rest of the UK. Um, in 2019, occupancy rates were 83.4% in London and 75.4% in the rest of the UK. In 2020, they've dipped down to 28.8% in London and 37.6% in the rest of the UK. And in 2021, they're only forecast to be 52.4% and 59.2% in the rest of the UK. So therefore, um, PricewaterhouseCoopers are talking about a four year period um, to get to a point at which uh, occupancy rates are up to pre-COVID-19 levels. So given that environment, I, I think there is a question about exactly who hotel guests are going to be. I think it's fairly obvious that guests are, like, are less likely to be business travellers. I think they're more likely to be tourists. And I think they're more likely to represent younger generations, Generation Z and millennials. I think guests could be looking for periods of extended stay for a number of different reasons. And I think um, hotels and, and guests need to appeal to a local community. So I think, you know, some guests could be locals who are looking to take advantage of exclusive or more secure amenities. I think there's also an emerging market of providing private space for work. And I think that's something that, you know, we've seen specifically in periods of extended lockdown. And what will guests be looking for? Um, I think they'll want to know that they're staying in a safe and secure environment. I think guests will want to will want a, a, an experiential um, uh, uh, stay at a hotel. So they're looking for luxury, hospitality, and a real qualitative experience. And I think they will also want to know that they can get a wide range of amenities in one location. So really, these are sort of quite personal experiences that guests will be looking for. And I think hotels will need to adapt to cater for those requirements. So as well as that, I think hotels may have to look to a, a wider audience. I think they may have to hybridize. And by that, I mean sort of offering a greater mix of facilities and perhaps sort of pairing and, and you know, twinning with other uses. So a wider array of uses with more emphasis, perhaps on business support, for example, and an expansion of leisure facilities as well. I think location also starts to become a critical factor, especially, you know, for, for new hotels. And I, I think, it, you know, if you look at what happened um, after lockdown 1.0 and, be, and uh, before lockdown 2.0, an exclusive rural hotel, you know, they all seem to be booked up. They will always have the potential to attract guests outside periods of, of restrictions. But I think it's much more difficult for urban hotels. I think an urban hotel really becomes uh, much more attractive for guests if it can offer a location that is of interest to business and tourists, whilst providing, you know, a, a very broad range of amenities and perhaps even, you know, a stronger connection to local communities. And, and in order to, for a hotel, an urban hotel to, to really adapt and, and incorporate 
the effects of, you know, long-term effects of coronavirus. I think the design and integration of external spaces will be a benefit both publicly and, and privately to that hotel. The ability to actually sort of manage those spaces, to use those spaces, and, and to add to the range of uses that, that, um, that, that the hotel actually um, incorporates. I think there's a there's a really um, strong uh, emphasis, you know, you see it in, in sort of uh, uh, local planning requirements these days to incorporate nature into the design. And I think for the urban hotel, the ability to introduce greening measures throughout the building pl plays a, a, an important part in engendering not only a sense of well-being, but, but also a, a connection to nature. And I think that's something that a, a lot of people have felt as part of um, uh, 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 events this year. I think within the room itself, um, the, the ability to uh, create uh, uh, the outside in and the inside out and the transitional spaces between um, those two worlds is quite important. And I think where and when the climate allows, that's something that you know, hotel design is going to have to incorporate in the future. And, and I think, you know, there's also um, lots of investment and development in, in technology. Um, there are now ways of communicating with buildings that didn't exist four or five years ago. Um, you, can, you can have a complete interaction with the building that you're in through an app. And, and we're even working on buildings where you can actually talk to the building. You can actually have a conversation with it. And, and, and the building can then respond, it can change the lighting conditions, it can change the local temperature. And, and I think that probably is, is going to be something that hotels, who I think have been a bit sort of slow to take up on this, are, are going to have to incorporate. I think there's also um, ways of density monitoring. You know, you can steer people away from a, a, a particular a restaurant or bar location and, and um, put them in a, 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 and, you know, ask them to sort of um, go to another direction. And, and I think there's also ways that, you know, you can, you can get in sort of opt-in automatic temperature reading, facial recognition that incorporates, you know, a, a keyless entry system. So you no longer have to really go to the, you know, the check-in or the concierge, concierge desk. There, there are ways of of actually sort of interacting through those check-in, check-out experiences that can be done automatically. I think also that air conditioning systems are, are probably going to have to be looked at as well. Um, I, I think that they're going to be, end up being sort of much more um, localized and, and not centralized, so not have sort of central plant spaces. And, and maybe, you know, the much more of an ability to be turned on and off as you sort of transition from an external space to an internal space, if the climate allows for that. And I think there's a lot of development now and research into the use of self-cleaning surfaces for, for high contact areas. Um, and I think, you know, that will, that will um, be, be part of um, uh, general hotel design and, and building design. I think it, within the room itself, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's, the, there's the possibility of actually using the lobby as a pass-through uh, decontamination zone. Uh, and I think, you know, because people are, if they do stay in a room, they're going to, um, you know, want to restrict the number of people sort of coming into their room. Um, you know, I think there are ways that you can then sort of start to communicate with people about the way you order your food. Um, and, you know, probably um, what you do with housekeeping so that, you know, housekeeping will not be a sort of daily occurrence, perhaps it'll, it'll be something that occurs uh, upon request only. And, and I think, you know, the, the, the space for the room itself is probably going to have to be completely re-envisaged. Uh, I think the room will not only need to be sort of suitable for periods of extended stay, so more space associated with it, but, but they, the hotels may have to adapt to attract guests who only want to be in, in hotel rooms for a short period of time. And therefore the layout needs to incorporate well-designed and functioning spaces and furniture to enable that to happen. You know, do, do, do you need a Zoom booth so that, you know, you can, you can continue working whilst your partner is doing something else? 
and I think the room probably will also need to incorporate space for leisure and exercise activities and have the space to uh, incorporate that equipment within it. So, uh, you know, again, this sort of the amount of space uh, associated with the room may have to increase. I think uh, for, for, for hotels themselves, they, they are uniquely placed to create this sense of security, especially around sort of hygiene. Uh, and I think, you know, hotels already have rigorous cleaning regimes in place. But I think um, it, it, you don't have to uh, look very far to see that, you know, a lot of hotels have now been publicizing the fact that they've increased their cleaning regimes. And I think they're looking to sort of um, private uh, hospital environs now to to up their game a little bit and to demonstrate that actually you know they they do have to take cleaning very seriously and and you know you, you can see that a lot of hotel operators are talking about the way they now leave rooms fallow for a certain period of time that they carry out uh, deep cleans between uh, every single stay and that they're monitoring their staff as well. So they're, they're carrying out their own staff health checks. They're, they're using sort of uh, employee bubbles and they're exploring different um, uh, cleaning techniques. So, you know, the use of uh, UV light and, and other cleaning methods, you know, such as fogging it is becoming much more the norm. And, and I think something that's also very interesting is that they're starting to partner with uh, large medical organizations in order to offer uh, hygiene excellence standards and and you know that's something that uh, I, I think we're going to see uh, much more of in the, in the future. So, so for the amenities themselves um, I, I think that, you know that they've always been very important to hotels but I think they're going to uh, increase import in importance. People will want to use amenities uh, and that whilst there might be restrictions about the way you use them, that, that will only mean that actually the space allocated to those amenities may need to increase. Um, and I think, you know, that there is something uh, that we all enjoy about sort of going to, to a, a hotel and, and, you know, having sort of exclusive use of, of their gym facilities or their swimming facilities and, you know, spa and other leisure facilities. And that's part of that sort of qualitative experiential experience. And I think that will become even more important, especially for urban hotels. And I, and I think then there's also um, uh, the benefits associated with members clubs and appealing to a, so a, a local clientele as well. It, it's interesting in New York, I see that statistics associated with private club membership in New York have, have risen dramatically in the past few months. Uh, food and dining is is going to be uh, a very different uh, experience, I think, and uh, and again, I think this is where sort of flexibility um, really is the key for for hotels. Um, they're going to have to design and provide a range of uh, food and dining experiences that that incorporate uh, a, a, vi a wide variety of spaces. And, and you know both internal and external and catering for different sizes of parties and I think I think you know that's that's going to become the norm. I think private dining will also become uh, much more important for hotels and and this ability to you know again utilize internal and external dining options you know should should the climate allow and then all of that has knock-on implications for the way uh, the kitchen functions for where the kitchen is located and even connectivity for front of house and back of house spaces between dining areas and kitchens. And I think the same is, is really true for event spaces. People are still going to want to organize events, whether it be, uh, you know, shareholder meeting or, uh, you know, a wedding celebration. Uh, but then, uh, you know, the, there needs to be the space in order to be able to incorporate such events. So, again, I think there could be a greater space allocation for event spaces. I events that, you know, they already, uh, hotels already have to cater and, and be very flexible in respect to the event spaces. 
And therefore, I think we're going to see much more use of sort of active partitions and movable walls in order to divide spaces up. And that has, again, implications on circulation and the way you move people um, through the hotel itself. And, and I think there could be some um, uh, sustainability benefits associated with, with this as well. I think, you know, the incorporation of, of greening strategy is something that we would all see as uh, very positive. And, and again, you know, the reduction in the amount of air conditioning used in, in, um, in, in hotel design, I think, could be a, a, a real positive, you know, and, and allow facades uh, to be openable and breathe a little bit more. I think the use of passive cleaning techniques, such as UV light, which, uh, OK, it's quite harmful to, to you know, uh, to, to humans, but actually, um, you know, relies on electricity. It doesn't rely on the use of uh, more harmful chemicals and perhaps even a reduction in consumables like, you know, towel uh, washing and soaps due to, you know, restriction in, in, in the room service offer. So what, what does all of this mean for hotels? So I, I think hotels are going to have to increase confidence levels in order to maintain occupancy rates. Um, and, and they're going to have to do that through a number of different sort of methods. They're going to have to diversify and increase their appeal to a wider audience. I think the spread and proportion of amenities to room numbers will need to increase, as will space for circulation rooms. And I think room sizes will need to be larger. I think hotels are going to have to invest in new technologies for cleaning materials and, and to allow for uh, uh, guest interaction through apps and new technology. And I think new build hotels are, have to, are going to have to really carefully think about location and the relationship of building to open space. I think the architecture will need to incorporate features to allow for natural ventilation balconies and localized air conditioning solutions. And, and I think the use of vertical and horizontal greening will become a significant design feature. I would hope that ultimately this could make hotels more relevant and more meaningful and better connected to their local communities. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Just to remind you, Ruth Slavid will be chairing the panel discussion immediately after our opening presentations. And if you'd like to ask a question, please click on Q&A. Our final presentation comes from Ross Finney, Sales Director, SIG Design Technology. Um, hello everyone, my name is Ross Finney. I work for Design Technology. Um, I'm Sales Director for uh, the SIG Design Technology Group. Um, I'm here today to talk to you about maximizing the roof and minimizing the risk. Um, what do we really mean by that? Um, I think we mean that we want to really make uh, it fifth element work a little bit harder for you, certainly as, as clients or as architects. Um, the cost of land is obviously increasing, um, but we want to really try and increase the footprint of the building, um, try and add some additional space uh, and create an environment that's actually a usable space. Um, once we've kind of got there, it's about optimizing the structural footprint of, of the building itself. Um, and the roof obviously is a, is, a, is a great place to do this, certainly with flat roofing. Um, and really it's about deciphering whether you want to use it as a functional space. Um, and within that would mean things like uh, blue roof, uh, whether you've got plant material up there, green roofing, or whether it's a usable space um, as sort of a terrace roof. So sometimes you see in the hotels, some sky lounges and sky bars and roof gardens and stuff like that. Um, and it's about trying to decipher actually whilst we're designing this flat roof, could we use that roof as a functional or a usable space? Um, if we did so you could actually uh, certainly specify blue roof, you could actually do what we'd call a uh, functional and uh, a usable space. So you can have uh, a cross between uh, both functionality of storing water. Basically, you want to alleviate the risk of urban flooding. Uh, and studs, studs really, sustainable drainage. Uh, and, and, and what blue roofs are really is storing water onto the roof and reducing the flash floods risks coming off, um, the water runoff from a flash storm or something like that. Um, we can combine that as well with green roofing because green roofing is also another form of uh, 
water attenuation and slowing the water runoff down from any storm. Um, but also you can then utilize that as a, a, a functional space as well. So uh, whether you have paving or terraces and stuff like that on top of the blue roof, because it tends to be, as you can see from the, the diagram there, hidden beneath the finished roof surface. And it's about just storing that water, and releasing it slowly into the, um, into the infrastructure system and drains below. Um, the reason obviously you can also look at green roofing is not to mention just to slow the water runoff uh, and it does that certainly by 50% on a water on a, on a rainwater lag time as just a standard flat roofing um, but it also does things like count as the heat island effect um, although there's no figures certainly grow would um, grow is the industry standard um, where people are looking at trying to generate figures for things like thermal and acoustic uh, uh, so performance would be the best way to, to suggest that. Um, there is no figures or, or results that actually suggest these have a, um, a, a, an advantage to. I think it's just everyone needs to use it as common sense. Just because of the thermal mass that's there, because of, you can imagine some um, uh, a growing medium, it's just basically a dense substrate and a mass there. So we do know just by rule of thumb that actually there is going to be a thermal gain there and there of course will be an acoustic gain. The other thing is the benefit for it certainly in a, in a hotel environment is that it's um, aesthetically pleasing and certainly one for um, instead of looking out onto a flat roof space where I'm, I know everyone's common and it's not really the most attractive of, of, of uh, roof spaces to add a green roof um, would then add some colour into a landscape as you can see just from the picture on the right. Well, how do you get there? One thing we really need to look at is how you specify the waterproofing choice and also the, uh, the, the blue roof supplier in conjunction with the manufacturer, the waterproofing manufacturer. Um, there's several design factors that you need to consider. So things like weight, um, as you can imagine, if you're going to store a lot of water onto the roof, you're also going to then increase weight onto that structure. Um, you need to think about the buildability factors, um, how we um, actually build and sequence that uh, so that actually it's a, it's a smooth process and, and you don't get conf confrontation between two installation contractors, the roofing contractor and the blue roofing contractor. And of course, product cho choice is, is, is really where that comes into it. And uh, what you try, what I would suggest and what I would hope that people will do is look to, to specify um, the right product, but with the right ins installation contractor who could do also work hand in hand with that blue roof designer and manufacturer. Um, and of course, then that relays then back into the guarantees. You want to make sure that actually once you specify this blue roof and the waterproofing, that they're all counteract to each other and they cross indemnifying each other guarantee. The last thing you'd want actually is damage to any roof or blue roof. Certainly, you can imagine we're storing water and using it as a functional space. The last thing we'd want to do is then stop um, get a problem with that roof and have to re rip that whole roof up to find and source a leak to be able to fix it. So you want a one system guarantee where you go to a single manufacturer to get that sort of advice. Is the product right for the job? Um, we have obviously a full suite of products, so we, we can specify design technology, anything from, from single ply through to built up roofing felts, uh, through to hot melt uh, solutions. and and. and the drivers always would be things like aesthetics, certainly from the architectural point of view. Um, what the structure, how's the structure built? And certainly if we're going to utilise a roof as a roof, uh, an amenity space or something like that, it would suggest that, look, there's going to be a, a certain amount of live loads, um, some foot traffic going across it. So look, we would always suggest getting the expert advice at an early stage. Um, work with the manufacturers or the suppliers to be able to understand what the key drivers are from, from, from you as architects. Uh, and what the end result and the use of the building will be after it's, um, after it's released to the client. From there, we need to make sure that actually, look, we meet the re relevant regulations, part L, part B, part, part E in, in the regulations. We need to understand that, look, actually anything that we're specifying actually works well with the building regulations. So weight loading, drainage and falls, um, we have to know there's a new British standards that dictates that you can't lay a roof flat, flat. But if you were, say, for example, looking to utilise uh, a blue roof design, then actually you'd have to contradict the British standard because you need the blue roof to be a flat roofing design, which means that actually it can be designed and hold a certain amount of water there. If you introduce 
falls into a blue roof, you're basically counteracting the, the, the water runoff uh, frequency. So you really are already, if you think you can imagine what a blue roof does, it, it, it slows the water run down. So you have to then go to an expert to be able to understand that um, or how the falls work and how you're going to design the system to meet the regulations. Upstand heights is another thing you need to be fully aware of. Door thresholds and anything, certainly if you're coming out um, from onto a terraced area and it's a, it's a usable space. Um, normally, the British standard would say 150 mil above the finished roof finish. Um, that would be paviors. Uh, that would be uh, any sort of timber finish or anything like that you'd put on top to be a decking or whatever else you were coming out on. And of course, the last thing you want to do is step down out of onto a terrace. You really, as, as architects, would look to specify a level threshold anywhere you could. And of course, that means that you have to get the interfaces correct. So you need to make sure that there's time spent to design those interfaces at the correct time up, up front before it goes out to tender so there's no surprises. And certainly when you're looking to utilise the roof as, a, as an amenity space. Um, from there, it's about how we install it. We have to then make sure that actually we get, get it correctly. Um, so it's about the programming. Um, it's about the sequencing. And actually, once we've actually finished the waterproofing, do we then make sure that we've got the right protection in there? Certainly, if we're installing further things like terraces and stuff, the last thing we want to use is the roof as a working platform. Uh, and you'll find that actually that's all about getting it designed and sequenced at the right time. So that actually when the roof's installed, there is no follow-on trades going on. There's no trades that are then going to cause damage to that roofing system before that building's handed over. Um, at DNT, this is what we try and do. Um, we, we talk about the eight steps to the perfect roof. Uh, and really it's about, look, stage one is a product agnostic thing. Um, uh, we, we can select the correct product for the right application. Um, so rather than just being a single manufacturer describing something that we would go for, we can actually give some, some expert advice on actually which system is more practical and soaps that application. And we have our own in-house design team, so we have our own PI insurance, covers our designs for up to £10 million. Um, we obviously um, will make sure that we meet the regulations uh, as part and parcel of um, being able to offer that, that design expertise. Um, we should be able to have confidence in supply because we are distributed by by trade. We train our own contractors in the systems that we specify, and then we monitor that installation. Um, we want to be able to give a reliable guarantee, a full guarantee. The only way we do that is if we get the first sort of seven of these correct. And of course, certainly uh, with, with any flat roofing product, it will be uh, some planned maintenance. Um, there is no such magical product that there is no maintenance required and the British standards alone uh, uh, dictate that you must go up and, and maintain a roof for at least twice yearly. Um, just a little bit about what materials we do supply so that you can understand about why we can select different products to be the right application. So we've, we've got single ply roofing membranes, uh, some liquid waterproofing, um, some hot melt and polymer modified bitumens, and then your, your traditional bitumen uh, built up roofing felts. Um, we also have a zinc and copper business that looks after the hard metal and cutting, uh, some natural slate, and we obviously specialize in, in, in green roofing and blue roofing as well. Thank you for your time. Um, what I would say is we, we've obviously uh, run a CPD program, but we also have on our website a flat roofing check, uh, checklist. Um, what I would say is a very handy thing for specifiers to look at. Um, it goes through a process from um, understanding the employee's requirements, then design factors, and then buildability factors. So much like we've done in this presentation, it takes you through a small stage process where you'll be able to understand or ask the relevant questions of certain the supplier that comes in to see it. Thank you for your time. Many thanks, Ross, Mark, and Dexter, who now join for our panel discussion with our chair, Ruth Slavid. Thank you very much, Dave. And I'd like to thank all three presenters for really fascinating um, presentations. We are going to have a session of questions now. There have been some questions sent in, which are quite challenging, but there's still the opportunity to ask more. So if you look under the um, presentation screen, uh, you have got a number of icons and one of those you can ask a question on. Don't feel you've missed the boat. There's still the opportunity to ask a question if you'd like to. Um, well, as I said, I really enjoyed all those presentations. I thought Ross talking about blue and green roofs was uh, really 
relevant. And obviously one of the people listening had much the same thought as I did uh, because he came in and said, uh, should the use of roof spaces as useful spaces should be made mandatory, discuss. Now I know um, Mark and Dexter, you both talked about outdoor space. Uh, I'll come to Mark first. Do you actually think this should be mandatory on new hotel developments? I think it's a great idea. I think um, you know the roofscape is uh, is an amazing way of of using you know not only the space itself but actually also to uh, maximise views and uh, you know engage with um, the surrounding area. And, and I think you know if if um, if we do go down a route where plant um, isn't so much centralised but is actually associated with individual hotel rooms and individual spaces. And actually, it starts to free up um, roof space because it's one of the it's one of the blockers at the moment in 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 um, MEP design, I think, um, that stops you from being able to use the roof. So, I, I think you know, roofscape, terraces, um, all of those elements that sort of activate the outside of the building and enable people to explore the outside of buildings is is a really positive thing. So that's plants, not plant. What, what about you, Dexter? Anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I, I agree that um, the roofscapes are important, but you have to also think about the location of the hotel. Um, one of the uh, mandatory requirements that I remember from Westminster planning was that they were very concerned about the use of roofscape in regard to uh, residential amenity, because you know open roofs tend to be places where noise is made. And uh, this has to be very carefully thought about because if you're close to residential uh, dwellings, um, you don't want events on roofscape and you don't want a situation where you're having to shut people down at 10 o'clock like we've got in COVID at the moment. So it needs to be thought about. I think there was a lot of interesting talk about the Urban Hotel. And I know uh, in one of the presentations that um, I think it was you, Dexter, who said, well, actually, uh, during the pandemic, actually, rural hotels have done really well because as soon as we were allowed to, everybody wanted to get away to the countryside. But nevertheless, um, the sort of presentation is very much focused on the urban. And one of our viewers has said, how can you, how would you apply what you said about urban hotels to country hotels? Country and rural hotels have certain advantages be because of their locations. Um, and, and normally, you know, they are associated with space uh, and, and, and people go there for the destination. But I, I think even they have had to adapt in certain ways and will need to adapt. So, uh, you know, the, there's, there's still the cleaning regimes that um, they have to put in place. I, I think there's also um, going to be the requirement for country hotels to, to still adapt to new technologies. Um, to, to, to look at the way that um, uh, contactless check-in can, can work. Um, you know, I think that's where some of the country hotel interfaces um, with, with their guests, you know, have, have sort of been let down a little bit. I, I think also, you know, the dining experience, th there probably will need to be more uh, in-room dining facilities um, that country hotels need to explore. And I also think, you know, that some country hotels, um, room sizes within country hotels can be quite small actually, um, because they do have you know so much extra space. So so therefore, more flexibility within the room, better design of um, furniture that you know um, that is adaptive that that can be put away to create more space it is something that I I think you know country hotels probably will have to um, review and 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 look at. Thank you very much. Um, I've had a couple of questions as well um, about apart hotels and whether or not you see a future for them. And in particular, uh, one of the questioners said, well, you have, you know, if you have an apart hotel, you actually have more control yourself over um, hygiene and things like that. Um, I'm going to put this question to Dexter again, but I'm afraid Dexter, I know you've got fascinating things to say, but if technologically you're not doing too well, I may cut you off um, and bat it back to Mark. But let's hope we can hear an answer from you. I'll try. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. 
I'm, I'm back in life. <laughs> yes. No, sorry about that uh, internet connection. Look, a part hotels, the, the big bonus of part hotels have is that you really do have the sanctity of your room and you can cook and you can, you can, you can uh, have your own s small apartment. So the, uh, it's, it, in a way, it's a much more ideal um, model from a, a COVID perspective. Thank you. Um, and I've got another question here. And while you're working well, Dexter, I'll throw this one to you first. It's the question is how will hotels reinvent their model to cater for the new demand in remote working and meeting space? And I must say, when you were presenting and you said, oh, you can come into this hotel and you can sit and work and maybe you'll have a cup of coffee. I thought that's a really attractive model for the user. Financially, it doesn't sound all that um, attractive for um, the operator and I wonder how they work. I mean, I understand about hiring formal meeting spaces, but the informal aspect. Well, um, what they do is they create a, a, an environment where people want to stay. And, you know, the, the, the revenue of a hotel is, is always going to be the, the hotel room predominantly. But uh, the ability to make um, a space uh, such as a lobby, a revenue generator by virtue of being able to sell coffees and teas and lunch and whatever the case may be. Is it the moment? And certainly the ability of the hotel, as I talked about, to actually put some retail, such as daily facilities and things like that, um, is a contributor both to the neighborhood and also to the hotel at the market of where it's located. Um, in terms of um, urban situation, I mean, uh, just to go back to a little bit of what, what you were saying earlier, I think one of the problems we've got at the moment with London is that added to the fact that there's not a lot of people using uh, hotel facilities because uh, nobody's working in the city of the West End, yeah. um, you, you've got the situation, a ridiculous situation in my opinion, of a regime which has uh, in a way negatively impacted the uh, uh, desire for people to come into London at all. Um, not only the theatres and uh, uh, museums closed, but uh, our, our um, uh, politicians have in their infinite wisdom decided to add to the congestion charge and also add to uh, the ability for older people to come in by taking away the benefits. I mean, if anyone was trying to stop people coming and trading and doing work in London, they're doing a damn good job. Well, <laughs> thank you for that. I think um, quite a lot of us may have some criticisms of the government, but this isn't the place to air them. Um, it's the local I'm government. To... Okay, it's the local government. I apologize. <laughs> um, I'm going to put a question to um, Ross. Uh, I just think, I'm just wondering in planning terms, um, I know that people are, hotel developers like other developers are trying to squeeze in as much as they possibly can. And one of those things may be a height restriction. And I wonder whether the sort of roofs that you're talking about, green roofs and particularly blue roofs, there's you ever come across an issue where they're taking up so much depth that actually to put one in would actually, would mean that um, they might have to sacrifice a floor. I mean, it's not the whole depth of a floor, but if you've got a planning envelope, it might actually make it impossible to actually get what you want. No, very much so. Actually, Ruth, you're, you're spot on there. Um, uh, the, the depth's dependent on what system you're specifying and dependent on what they're looking to achieve from it. But um, yeah, the, the, if, if you have planning constraints on, on, on the height of the building, um, you, you could run into some real obstacles in that manner. Um, I think it tends to be actually, to be honest, um, uh, the, the type of waterproofing that we would specify if we were going to bury it and use it as, a, as, a, um, as an amenity space or even uh, the last thing you'd want really or functional space, the last thing you'd want actually is to have a problem on there. Um, therefore, this type of systems that we would specify tend to be that thicker and build up anyhow because uh, they're normally exposed systems. So inverted, um, and what that means is you'd probably have to use an inverted insulation board, a closed cell board or something like that. So it'd be XPS or EPS. Um, and they tend to be thicker because the, the K values aren't as good as your traditional polyisobinurate boards or anything like that. So you're actually building up just to get the U values that you require. Plus then you're adding in the depths of your pedestals. And of course the fire, we now, we're now coming into the, the fire requirements as well. So we have to make sure that the fire, the pedestals are, 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 are 
uh, are fireproof and all the rest of it. So um, all of these are building up. So restrictions and certainly door thresholds. You have to be very aware of the door yeah. thresholds and draining. Um, so, yeah, uh, very much so. It's something that you have to consider at early door stage when you're designing uh, and what you want to use that roof space for. Thank you very much indeed, Ross. Um, now, I know we had um, some discussion that came earlier in the presentations about the fact that, for example, um, traffic uh, is likely to be affected for three or four years, um, that you know, we won't get back to normal, normal immediately, whatever normal is or the new normal, as we all horribly say. But somebody said here, is there a need to wait for more COVID data because very little has been publicly released? And I suppose in particular, um, these questions of enhanced hygiene requirements and how that's going to affect design. Um, is, is there a problem, do you think, that perhaps we're reacting to something short term while designing something longer term? Um, or do you think those requirements are going to be there forever because everybody who's lived through this pandemic just knows how much they need to wash their hands? Uh, Mark, I'll put that to you. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I think it's very interesting actually because, um, you know, when I was first asked to speak, it was something that, that sort of crossed my mind. You know, how, how much of this is perhaps a knee jerk reaction to a current situation? Um, I, I do think, though, that the, the hotel industry, you know, has been changing and, and needs to change. And I think, you know, there is always this uh, requirement to uh, appeal to a wider audience. And, and, and therefore, um, I think, you know, the hotel, hotels do need to start realising that they do sit within communities. And if you can encourage um, new guests into your hotel that aren't necessarily just sort of you know staying overnight but they're starting to use facilities and you know they're, they're uh, 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 you know they get used to being in the hotel and they and they then want to explore other amenities then it can only be of a, a benefit to to the hotel in in the long run and i, I do think also that there there are some um uh, there, there are some really um, positive benefits, you know, in, in respect to sustainability to um, what the what the pandemic has sort of um, brought about with cleaning regimes. You know, um, UV light. We, we have a, a UV uh, robot running around the office at the moment. And, and you know, it, it's um, it, it's a way of, of um, uh, that has that been used in, in the health industry for a number of years. Um, you know, and, and I think hotels and, and other industries can explore um, the use of this new technology and it, and it stops harmful chemicals being sort of flushed through into the, in, into the ecosystem. That's fantastic. Um, I'm going to pass the same question over to Dexter now, but I'm also going to add another question which has come in, um, which is, do hotels have a part to play in the reinvention of the high street? I mean, that's obviously a, an issue that a lot of us are looking at. And I know you've talked about community and I think a lot of that Mark was talking about as well. Um, but are they going that's to absolutely. reinvent the high street or replace it? Well, absolutely. And they have been, as I, as I was pointing out in, in my slides er, uh, earlier, they, even before COVID, the hotels were really the lifeblood of a dying high street because a lot of retail opportunities have, 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 have gone. And hotels are, by nature, a 24-hour operation. And, mm -hmm. you know, the bringing of uh, that connection to, to the local community is really important. So the, the dry cleaner down the road, when he wants to go home to his family in the evening, he can bring his stuff into the hotel and the hotel will manage it for him and, 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 and allow that to happen. Same true with other, other kinds of um, retail, uh, florists, etc., etc. And the concept of, of a hotel, you know, producing fresh bread or croissants in the morning and being able to sell them to local neighbours, really important. Um, so the hotel is a, a lifeblood for, for, for what a many dying high street. So what you're really talking about is a kind of extension of the concierge service that um, guests used to get from certain hotels, kind of extending to the local community as well. Um, I, think, I think that's really interesting. And I just wonder how that balances with the fact that um, we're talking about 
you know increasing intelligent technology and the fact that maybe you know you scarcely need to check in because you can do it all in an automated way is it that we will be getting service and a lot of personal service but really for the things where we need it rather than the things where we don't yeah, i think so i mean we've got a lot of restaurants today where you order stuff or cafes on your on your mobile phone and it's brought to you because of the interface and uh, I think we're getting used to that and it's, it, it will be the norm Yes, I suppose what I was thinking, and maybe I'll put this to Mark as well, is um, that, you know, when you're coming in to pick up your dry cleaning after hours, you're probably wanting to do that from a human being, aren't, aren't you? Even after you've done your touchless touch-ins, check-ins. So I'm just wondering about the balance between those two things. Well, I, I, I know from my own experiences that when I'm working from home, you know, I'm desperate to speak to anybody, to be honest. So, so you know, <laughs> having that with the, uh, with the dry cleaning guy would be great. I, 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 I do think, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're doing a hotel at the moment and, and you know, not a plug, but, um, and, and it, you know, one Bishopsgate Plaza and it occupies a whole city block. And, and what's interesting about it is it's a brand new um, tower, um, but it also incorporates a, uh, a, 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 a frontage onto Devonshire Road, which is a, a Victoria Street, um, part of, uh, with a listed uh, shop front. And, and what, what's very interesting is that the, you know, the hotel realizes that actually it, it, its front door isn't just its immediate front door anymore. It's actually part of a whole estate and interfaces with, with um, you know, the, 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 the city around it. So it starts to actually manage um, those surrounding spaces. And therefore, you know, I, I think hotels realize that that actually the way they offer a retail element, the way they offer a, a restaurant facility it is actually all part of their perception. And, you know, if you, if you, if you do have these sort of um, city type hotels that do have different frontages, different uses within them at ground floor level, that actually, you know, the whole experience uh, becomes part of that hotel experience. And, and therefore, you know, if you go and get your dry cleaning from the hotel guy and have a conversation with him, you know, that is the start of your interface uh, with, with, with the operator and, and with the hotel. So, you know, if that's a good experience, you're much more likely to go back and, and uh, you, you know, use other facilities. And at the same time, presumably, you're take, the hotel's taking in the dry cleaning from the independent dry cleaner who's sh shut up shop at six o'clock and gone home to his family so actually they're not replacing independent uh, operators they're enhancing their offering are they i, I think that's right and, and also you know um, the, uh, in in my experience you know they're, they're actually if if they are sort of providing uh, a retail unit that that retail unit has a separate leasing structure but the 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 the, the way um that leasing structure works it, it can be managed by the hotel to offer sort of, um, uh, you know, facilities and, and uh, a retail environment that's complementary to the other elements that, that, you know, the hotel might be providing. Thank you very much. Uh, um, I've got Sorry. another question here about um, guest room design and it says, it asks how will guest room design need to change to cater for multiple activities? And I know that at one point, you know, we were talking about the fact that you may want um, a separate workspace, um, that you may want the ability to um, bring in uh, fitness equipment, you know, you might want a running machine or whatever. And I just, but we also had a conversation about the fact that actually ho hotel room size now is not really equated with ideas of luxury. You know, you can, I think actually this was a conversation we were having off screen, but um, that, you know, you can have a boutique hotel and actually the room is very small. And I'm just wondering, are, are hotels going to be incredibly clever and get more functions into the same room space? Or are they actually going to have to have bigger room spaces, which then in a certain building envelope means fewer rooms. And I wonder how that's going to affect their revenue model and what people are going to have to pay to stay in hotels. Shall I start with Dexter on this one? Yeah, I'm happy to answer. Um, I mean, there, there, pre COVID, there was, there's definitely been a push to smaller rooms. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of that 
um, has come about also by just being a lot more efficient about the way in which those rooms are designed. So, you know, architects, interiors, like designers like ourselves, are specializing in making the best use of that space because in a city, urban real estate is expensive and the more mm -hmm. keys that you can put on the site, the, the, the better it will be. Now, I mean, some of the tiny rooms go down to, you know, eight to 12 square meters. Uh, it's obviously quite difficult to uh, put other facilities other than a bed and a shower in a room mm -hmm. like that. But, but you know, the, the sort of 20 square meter room is, is perfectly capable of having a good bed, a good desk, and a place to put, you know, even some exercise equipment, as I was talking about in, in my slides. So I think that's possible. Uh, it's just a question of, 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 of doing it efficiently. Um, I'm not sure that the long-term effects of COVID are such that they're going to transform uh, uh, real estate to make all the rooms substantially larger overnight. Um, obviously, if you're in a resort hotel where you're uh, spending a, a holiday uh, over some period of time, you tend to have a lot more luggage, you tend to need a lot more space. So that's a different market. But the, the urban hotel um, is really a, a place where you're going to sleep, you're going to have a great shower and and you're going to do some work maybe maybe not because the the nature of um the kind of public spaces that uh, we've talked about that have been transforming hotel lobbies are such that they become kind of nice places to go and experience and i recognize that in a way right now i would rather be in a hotel room because of the issue of social distancing but as we move away from that um mm -hmm. there's something nice about working in a space where there's some activity and most people want that sort of experience. Mark, anything to add? I, I, I think it'll be, um, it's, it's obviously going to be driven by the market to a certain extent and, and what people want. Uh, it, I think if people are going to spend longer in their hotel rooms then I, I think there is an inevitability that actually hotel room sizes may have to increase. That, I, I think they will have to cater for uh, more external spaces directly linked to the room itself. But I think it's also going to drive um, a, a review of, of, of the way those spaces are laid out uh, and how clever those, those spaces are. You know, d does your bed need to be down all the time? Um, can, your, can your desk sort of fold away? Is, is there more flexibility that can be de um, designed into um, uh, the individual room itself and, and the elements of furniture within the room to, to allow for different activities to occur? I, I, I do think, you know, it, it does depend on how the sort of um, short to medium term future um, uh, works and you know whether or not all of the uh, vaccines that are now being talked about actually sort of uh, become effective but um, but but I do think that actually you know room design does need to be looked at it, it, it not just in terms of size but in terms of flexibility as well. And I think one of the points that both of you raised was um, this idea <clears throat> of individual climate control in a room because uh, partly as a pandemic response, um, that idea of circulating all that air round and round is a bit scary. Um, and one of the people watching this came in and said, well, they love the idea of individual climate control. Uh, how do you mitigate the additional environmental impact? Mark? Yeah, I, I think there are some uh, efficient systems that, um, you know, do exist. I think it starts becoming almost like a sort of an MBHR system or something, you know, within uh, within individual apartments rather than um, uh, you know with with, uh, with centralised systems. Um, I, I I I think um, you know it, 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 you're always going to uh, end up relying on some form of um, uh, ventilation system um, if you look at the climate in the UK at certain times, but. I do think you know we're sitting in an office now. We have windows open. Um, there is a centralised system associated with it. I, I guess we're going to have to rely on technology to um, uh, to allow improvements so that we're we're not using vital resources too much. Dexter. Well, I, I think it's the, the opposite to the question because if you've got a, a situation where you've got a vast 
air conditioning plant that's pumping hot or cold air or whatever the case may be around a building perpetually uh, people have always got the opportunity of opening a window and, and avoiding it but it's still pumping air around and it's taking up energy and making use of energy whereas if you have an individual air conditioning stroke heating heat exchange unit whatever the case may be in your own room uh, once you turn it off it's not it's not consuming energy and you know in those times of year when people want to open a window and the weather is nice and it's not pouring with rain or whatever the case may be and it's slightly warmer than it is today um you know that is a huge saving in energy and i i, I venture to say in the studies we're doing and we're doing several hotels at the moment where we're, we're adopting these systems it's a saving in cost it's a saving in cost of area of plant and 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 the technology has moved along a long way i mean when i started as an architect people jokingly referred to window shakers being those air conditioning units people hang out of windows oh well, yes in effect it's technology but it's moved ahead you know it's a bit like uh, everyone didn't believe in electric cars for many years but now we're all saying well hell we wish we developed electric rather than the internal combustion engine same thing is true of these units and they're now supremely efficient they're also quiet and they will be a huge energy saver and of course once we've all got the electric cars or well once all the vehicles are electric uh, the streets will be uh, much cleaner and we can all open the windows. Um, I think it's interesting that you talked about that as something that, you know, we've all talked about for ages and then it comes in and it becomes accepted. And I'm wondering, Ross, what you're seeing about blue roofs, because I think I've heard people talk about them for quite a long time. And then it's like, mm, yeah, but not really. And obviously the whole idea of the green roof has really taken off with everything from, you know, the sedum roof to the planted garden and the accessible roof. But are you really seeing a lot more interest in blue roofs now? You're muted. I think you're muted, Ross. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Is that better? Can you hear me? Yes, that's fine. Uh, yeah, we've seen a, a huge influx of, uh, of uh, the take up of blue roofs to be honest uh, on the roof I'll, I'll be honest i i wrote an article about how i really despise blue roof uh for which all my competitors have great uh, delight in uh <laughs> in sharing, in sharing uh certainly when we're tendering for blue roof um everyone likes to remind me i look i, I initially i'm a roofer and, and i've always been always been tall and, uh, and certainly designed to to get water off a roof uh, and, and blue roofs probably the opposite of that where we're trying to store water on that roof um, albeit by attenuation slowing it down um, but we have seen a vast vast it's certainly in some of the uh, inner city locations some of the urban locations where i think the infrastructure um, wouldn't support um uh, the, the, the way the railroads run off uh, in some ways it's um, it's actually been a planning constraint on some of them whereby you've right. got to be able to store and you haven't got the facility to be able to have water tanks beneath or, or wherever you would to sort of store this water it's become a function of a roof now um, and, and yeah the uptake's been quite colossal I think um, certainly some of the, the, the larger jobs uh, hospitals and so, so forth seem to be uh, taken up and, and hotels that's brilliant, thank you. Um, now, this looks slightly marginal because it's not something that any of you guys, as far as I know, are designing, but I'm sure it's going to affect the market for um, hotels. And this is someone saying, you know, with all the worries about the pandemic and things, do we think that ideas like homestays, and I guess that's things like Airbnb um, and all those other um, places that you can go to, are those going to disappear because um, people are too worried about the hygiene? I mean, I think, you, you know, you talked Dexter about the fact that a hotel brand can say, yes, this is how we clean our rooms. And my question is, if people are less comfortable about staying in individuals' homes, are they then going to be looking instead for a sort of inexpensive hotel option that's maybe a bit flexible, maybe a sort of hotel hostel cross or or whatever dexter well i i i've said for a while that hotels have got a, a stealing a march on all the other competitors in this market mm -hmm. but obviously i mean 
Airbnb have, uh, in, in their own way, imposed regimes of cleaning that uh, ostensibly owners are meant to follow. All I'm saying is for, for, for a guest who's uh, worried about it, you're more likely to be guaranteed uh, safety uh, out of a hotel than you are out of Airbnb, which is individual ownership. So that's just a fact. Um, the question is how uh, serious uh, going forward this issue is going to be um, mm -hmm. and how flexible people want to want to be. I mean, you know, uh, people are social distancing and people are not social distancing. So um, like ultimately it comes down to uh, individual choice. But thank you very much. And I think also thinking possibly um, about lower end, but maybe this is true in all hotel rooms. Somebody's asked the question, um, with the pressures on space and on energy usage, does this mark the end of the road for baths in hotels? What do you think, Dexter? Well, I think baths have been dying for some years. I mean, in, in all the hotels we're doing at this moment in time, unless it's a resort hotel, people have yes. time, they want to languish in the bath. In an urban situation, there's only one real market for, for, for baths, and that's the families, because uh, young children, uh, it's quite difficult to wash them in, 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 in a shower, as opposed to putting, propping them in a bath and filling it up with water. So I'd say that almost all the urban hotels that we're busy with at the moment, it's quite a lot, I'd say 90% of the, of the rooms are showers, shower only. And you'll have right. some suites you'll have some suites that will have a shower and a bath and and the top end of the market that the upper five star market you might have uh, both um, but you know even I don't know six seven years ago we did the Hilton Bankside which I referred to in my slides I mean that's a five star hotel and uh, contrary to my expectations the aspiration was, was was showers and we built that hotel with predominantly showers there are a few rooms which have baths and therefore the market of just to give people an option but but 90 percent of hotels are shower only and even in the five star plus market and you know the quality of shower is you know with a big rain shower and something special and maybe lighting or whatever the case may be is pretty well the norm uh the other alternative to that is a kind of a wet room concept where you get a shower and a bath in in, in a in a, in a com compartment and and that's popular but obviously it takes up more space so i think um the bath is, uh, in the urban sense, is pretty well deceased. Yeah, so as long as it doesn't end up like the place I stayed in once in France, which was rather wonderful, but very eccentric, which had a beautiful looking bath right in the middle of the room. And I made the mistake of leaning on it and it skidded across the floor because it was on casters. Um, <laughs> well, I was going to say, I, I, I was, uh, sorry to interrupt you, I was going to say yeah, that, yeah. you know, we have done several suites. I had a the baths in the in, in the room yeah that's that's quite popular but they weren't on casters <laughs> I no, think... no, no. Well, you've, got to, you've got to think about how the waste works i mean if it's on casters oh, i'd be very worried it's on a sort of um, flexi tube thing um it's all quite interesting no, we haven't, um, tried, we haven't tried that it could be a new idea <laughs> absolutely um i suppose that's the thing isn't it that are we going to lose the eccentricity that one used to get with sort of individual operators and, you know, odd conversions and um, homestays and so on? Are we all going to be in rooms which are going in hotels, which are going to be nicer and nicer, but sort of nice in a rather rational, worked out way rather than those odd eccentricities that I don't know how many bad hotels you've stayed in, but they've been quite memorable for me, sometimes in good and sometimes in bad ways. Dexter. Oh, sorry, I think, you know, I would speak for our interior design department and say that we are always designing bespoke hotel rooms for each location, which are very uh, focused on something special about the area. And, and it's again down to that concept of locality. And people want to engage with something that engages in the specifics of, of that space or neighborhood or whatever the case may be and having some personality. And uh, we all move away from places that are lacking in personality. That's why I was explaining to you that the meeting room that we was very successful at Bunchy and Mercer has, it feels like a, a fun place to be. And there's no reason mm. why hotel rooms because of uh, cleanliness have to be 
uh, anodyne spaces. They can still be beautiful. Um, but yes. obviously, clean, cleaning has got to be taken into account. But that's the role of our interior designers, and each hotel is unique. And I think you talked about, I think it was you that was talking about the idea that where once we thought a hotel should be a home away from home, actually we want it to be completely different from home. And especially now, yeah. uh, we've all been locked up in our homes for far too long. Um, so do you, what do you think it is that we don't have in our homes that we want to get when we go into a hotel? I'll put that to Dexter and then I'll come on to Mark. I think just something different, a new experience. People are looking for experiences. People pay a fortune for having experiences. And it's that's, you know, the, 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 the thing that the, the, the next generation of hotel guests are looking for. They're looking for experiences and they're also looking for authenticity and connection to a locality and a neighborhood. And that's why the, the, the lobbies that are local into them are incredibly successful. I mean, uh, there's a fantastic uh, hostel uh, brand in South Africa, funnily enough, uh, called Once. And uh, they have created a situation where they really engage the uh, residents in the hostel with the neighborhood in, the, in a marvelous way. And uh, it's a, extraordinary because they're getting business out of uh, business travelers that a hostel would normally not attract against a, a hotel. What about you, Mark? Yeah, I, I, I think it does come down to experience. And I, I, I think um, uh, that people are also looking for the personal touch, um, you know, something that actually relates directly to them and responds to them. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, because we've all been cooped up for far too long, you know, as soon as we were allowed to sort of uh, travel to hotels, you know, a lot of my friends, you know, did exactly that because uh, they wanted uh, an experience that was away from home. Uh, they wanted to uh, get out and you know use a swimming pool in a limited way or a spa, you know, and 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 to have that sort of personal experience again. It's a bit of luxury. And I wonder, Ross, whether you see this in the sort of green and blue roofs that people want to design. I mean, there is a sort of there's a functional way of doing it, isn't there, where you go, right, we'll have a green roof, we'll stick a seed and blanket over the whole thing and that ticks some boxes on biodiversity and holding a bit of rainwater back. And presumably you can be similarly sort of technical about a blue roof. And while I, uh, I'm using technical in a slightly disparaging way, I know obviously it's essential to get it technically right. Um, but I wonder whether you're seeing people being really quite ambitious about their roofs in terms of what they're trying to do on their, in terms of an experience. Yeah, very much so. I look, listen, if you think about it, I, I, I suppose we're, we're very um, uh, sort of uh, dreamlike and thinking of a, of a green roof as, as an extensive green roof with sediums. And, uh, but obviously, look, you've got intensive green roofs where you can build parks on, on roofs. Uh, some of the shopping centres that you you sort of look at and think, I mean, that's that's effectively a, a green roof. Um, so, yeah, there's people have been uh, massively adventurous. So, and some people have been uh, adventurous with with sediments. So, picking, uh, picking certain types of foliage to be able to uh, put logos in. Uh, I know Lloyds Bank did one uh, in the city where they, they've got that, the black horse with sedum. Um, uh, look, there's, there's all sorts of places you can go to. Obviously, uh, there's cost issues associated to it, but I'll, I would say certainly with green roofing. Blue roofing, um, um, I don't suppose there's a visualisation for anyone. Um, it's always buried, so there's no visualisation or, or benefit to it. It's, it's more of a sustainability thing uh, and support of the infrastructure. Um, uh, um, so you're just sort of slowing the water a bit. No one really sees the effectiveness of it, so it's all, it's all done by um, uh, the sort of cartridges were inside the rainwater outlets and, and calculations to make sure that we slow the water runoff. But we, we always bury it, so it's not exposed, it's not something everyone ever, ever sees. Um, so you don't ever get a pool yes. or anything, yeah? Uh, that, uh, do you know, that would be like my worst nightmare, Ruth. Uh, I'll be very <laughs> right. I, I, uh, this is where I, you know, traditionally when people would talk about blue roofs, this is what they used to do. Um, I mean, I suppose you've got um, grey water uh, uh, harvesting and, and, and sort of uh, rainwater harvesting and stuff like that, you know. Uh, how far do you take it? You can take it really sustainable and start to use some of the, the water and harvest that water and regenerate it. But uh, I, as a roofer, really dislike that. 
um, <laughs> only because I trained to get the water off. Uh, and fundamentally, look, if there's ever a problem, I just the thought of having this tank of water on your roof just scares the living Jesus, that absolutely scares me, terrifies me. <laughs> I think, oh my God. Um, but, but you know, you are talking earlier, I'm sure it was whether it was offline or online, but um, your, your poor lady who was on one of these calls where the kitchen yeah, kitchen ceiling came in, I can imagine that happening on a roof uh, just while I was sitting there with this blue roof. It would be de devastating. But look, it's all well managed now. Um, and I, I think actually fundamentally you can go as far as you want it and you can make it a practical and an individual space. So we've all been to these roof bar, roof bar gardens and stuff like that where you can, um, there's one actually just opposite Tower Bridge. You can go up and it, it overlooks the Tower Bridge. I mean, it's absolutely stunning. Fantastic environments, fantastic space. Um, and, and it's a really great way to see the city. It's something that you would never see. You're, you know, you're all sitting there having a drink or a cup of coffee uh, and overlooking uh, Tower Bridge, which, to be honest, you would never, as a as a member of the public, get access to that sort of view. Um, so, really, really prominent and great way of getting the public in. That's fantastic. I think that's such a high that um, I'm going to make that our last question. Uh, we're getting towards the end of our time, and. Um, well, I've really enjoyed it all and I've learned a great deal, which I think is the point of it all. Um, that's because we have had three really tip top speakers. Uh, I have to thank Architecture Today for um, making that possible. Uh, and I suppose, and I have to thank Ross as well for uh, SIG for helping make it possible. But all three of you have been so engaged and so knowledgeable. And I just want to thank you all for sharing your knowledge with us. Um, and of course, the other part of this, which is equally important, are the people who have been listening and not just listening, but sending in the questions and interacting with us as much as it's possible to do in these times. Uh, there will be an opportunity to see the recording of this. Um, it'll probably be available, if not later today, then uh, probably by tomorrow, that's Friday, it's not the weekend. We have to remember where we are in these odd times. Um, so I think that really pulls it to an end. Um, I just can't wait to go and stay in a really exciting hotel now. And um, I'll see you there and maybe we can all meet and maybe we can have another one of these seminars uh, hosted from uh, a fabulous hotel that one of you have designed. So thank you very much indeed to everybody who's taken part, to everyone who's made it possible, including making it technically possible. And uh, I'm going to call this to an end and say goodbye to you all and thank you for being part of it. Thank you.